Welcome back, everyone, to the Rumor Flies podcast. I'm Josh. And I'm Ryan. And we are here with Greg from In-Depth Media, our buddy, making sure we do everything correctly and don't burn this place down in the process. Hey, Greg. Hey, Greg. So today we are going to mix it up from episode one, which we talked about Disney. Uh, Today we're here, we're going to talk about food and myths, legends, conspiracies, things of that nature. This is going to be something great that I'm really into. And don't say conspiracies. People are going to be expecting that every episode. I I, I know, but I I use that (laughs) word because there's a purpose for it. There is a food that involves a conspiracy, so I'll just kind of let that linger and you'll see as the show goes on what I'm talking about. Oh, all right. A right, little, little, little preview for you, a little foreshadowing, if you may. Foreshadowing the shit out of this. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I believe you want to start off today's episode with a little housekeeping from episode one, Ryan. Am I correct about that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I have an apology for everybody that was listening to the first episode. I um, subconsciously made a joke about me leaving a gas station and being a certain height depending on which gas station I left in the last episode, I didn't realize until about three days after recording that I had just lifted a Ron White joke. So anyway, I would like to apologize formally to the audience and not to Ron White because <laughs> I reminded you about like the Blue Collar Comedy Tour and you probably got flashbacks from that. I'm really sorry. It won't happen again. And just... I will correct myself if anything like that happens again. So sorry to everyone listening, but uh, f*** you, Ron White. I believe that's what we're saying. You're going to get your own, Josh. It's yeah, fine. You're I, gonna get- I, it's going to happen, I'm sure. I mean, at least you were man enough to admit that you, you took the joke from him. Yeah. You didn't well, You didn't Dane Cook it to Louis C.K., you know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, okay. So we're going to start off this episode, and I'm going to lead off here. We're going to talk about the myth about chewing gum. And what I mean is if you swallow chewing gum... It stays in your stomach for seven years. It does. It totally does. It 100% does not. But 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 I'll explain why. So gum is made up of three major things. Sugars, artificial sweeteners, and gum resin. Now, your body can digest the artificial sweeteners and the sugars, but the gum resin, it kind of has a little problem with. It kind of just stays in there for a little while. So when you, when you swallow your gum, it goes down your throat into your stomach acid where... The stump, your stomach acid will d- dissolve and break apart everything that it can, the nutrients and whatnot. But when it gets to the gum resin, it's just kind of stuck there and there's nothing it really can do. So it just pushes everything through your intestines and then you shit it out like you normally would or piss it out or whatever it is. But the gum resin just kind of stays intact. So it just kind of floats around in you for an extra day or two. But if you swallow your gum, it's not stuck in there for, you know, seven years. It's mostly like you know two to four days three to five days something like that so you don't have to worry about that i don't know if that was an issue with you when you were a kid i don't know if you swallowed gum when you were a kid i did no i wasn't dumb no yeah so basically the problems that can come from swallowing gum is oh i did used to swallow um i would swallow lifesavers whole because everybody i I remember here a long time ago they had the hold them so i wouldn't choke so i would just be like oh it's fine for me to go ahead and just swallow them whole it's it's all right You know, it's funny enough, there was one time I was sick and I took a throat lozenger and I was really big into swallowing pills because I I always assumed like swallowing pills meant that you were actually getting healthier and you were beating whatever the virus or the infection was. So I swallowed a throat lozenger and it was the most miserable weekend of my life because that son of a bitch was stuck in my throat. It was lodged in there. (laughs) And every time I swallowed, I tasted grape. I'll never forget that. I was so fucking pissed. I was so upset. I, I, I'll never forget that. So like everything was just complimented by the taste of grape as you were eating. Just yeah. like grape burger. Yeah, grape exactly. Steak, yeah. You know? we, we eat this McDonald's, you know, chicken nuggets with uh, a little uh, grape after flavor that comes through the palate. You know, I hear if you swallow one of those lodges and keep it there for long enough, you actually turn into Grimace. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we'll, you know what? We'll we'll make that episode you know, farther down the line. We'll we'll look into that myth. But when it, when it uh, when it comes to gum, the only problem that comes with it is if you swallow too much of it. So much like everything in life, moderation is key. So you swallow too much gum, it could cause a blockage. Now there was a paper in 1998 that described a four year old boy uh, having a two year history of comp- constipation. He couldn't he couldn't go dookie. Because he swallowed too much gum because he that's what he was always told to do. 
from what he says. He his wasn't parent, taking his Metamucil. No, he was not taking his Metamucil. So they actually had to go in and un, you know, take out the blockage, remove it from him. And then there was another story of uh, a, like a one and a half year old who swallowed gum, which I don't know why you give a one and a half year old gum in the first place. That's something maybe social services should look into. This will keep him busy for a while. Yeah, right? Like, it's just like, you little bastard, just go, you know, chew some gum for a while. Get away from me. You know, I'm trying to cheat on your father, whatever. So the the, the one and a half year old, though, swallowed the gum and then swallowed some coins after it. And the gum caused the coins to lodge together. And that was an issue. So they had to go in and operate on that little one and a half year old to take it out. Oh, he had a little gummy piggy bank in his stomach afterwards. <laughs> little little gum depository, if you will. You know, just just guessing right now. I'm not a doctor, but I really think that the gum was kind of like the latter of the issues when it came to that one right there. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole lot of other problems that are going on there. And I don't think the gum is, is the front and center of that. When you have at least like 15 effigies of presidents in your stomach, that might be a problem. <laughs> yeah, not to mention all the toxins from the metal and stuff that's going through your digestive tract. Ugh. Ugh. Nasty. 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 So, uh, n- moving on from chewing gum, I think we covered that fully. So, uh, Ryan, what you got next? All right. So, this one's one of my favorites. Actually, this wasn't originally on the episode plan until I, over the weekend, was talking with one of uh, my fiance's cousins, and I heard this thing that I hear all the damn time. It just kind of like slips through my head because I've been ignoring it so much. I was like, this is going on the docket immediately. Um, and that myth is that alcohol cooks out of food. Uh, like you can cook with food, you can cook with alcohol in whatever dish you're making and it will completely cook out and you don't have to worry about having to, you know, not pass your, uh, ankle bracelet test or anything like that. Not that everybody has one, but I, I certainly don't, you know. So, so, I mean, I was always taught growing up with cooking that, you know, if you add like a little wine to your food, it was fine that it would completely defaze. And like, that's what they use for, um, What's uh, Bananas Foster? Right. So that is a flambéing technique when you just kind of quickly like flash fry it with a little bit of rum or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the main uh, alcohol that's in Bananas Foster, at least this was traditionally used. Um, and to anybody that doesn't know what Bananas Foster is, it's a nice little dish usually where they just kind of pan fry some bananas with some rum and a few other spices, I believe cinnamon and a few, uh, just a few other different things. And sometimes it comes with ice cream, which I suggest every time. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know what Bananas Foster is, you're missing out on life. But usually they go ahead and bring it out to the table for you. Like, you know, they actually cook it in front of you if you go to a nice enough restaurant. And it's, it's a cool show because like, you know, it flames up and everything and maybe catches someone's hair on fire and then, you know. It, it's still fun, you know, everybody had something talk. to talk about the next yeah, day. Great, great table talk. Yeah, but um, so about that, turns out that alcohol cooks out in minute quantities uh, for the amount that people would traditionally cook with it. Um, just like things like milk or cream or yogurt and like Indian dishes, you don't really put some ingredients in right at the beginning. And alcohol is one of those because you kind of want the flavor. Like usually when people make cacava, which is um, a stewed chicken and wine, yeah. uh, usually you end up adding some wine towards the end. And I'm going to get like some hate mail from some chefs telling me I'm doing things completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, but for the most part, it's kind of like to add the flavor. Uh, first off, we're going to go ahead with this. If you can taste something and say, oh, that does have a little bit of a rum taste in it, or that does have a little bit of a wine taste in it. A uh, little caveat, there is no such thing as artificial alcohol flavor, at least not that I've ever found. So if you're eating if you're eating something and you taste alcohol in it, that means there's alcohol in it. Um, the University of Idaho actually did a little study that uh, they go in ahead and tried to see how much alcohol evaporated out of solution over time. And what they found out that, number one, flambéing stuff like a banana foster, whatever amount of alcohol you use is, for that amount of time you're flambéing, about 75% of that alcohol is actually retained in the food. Wow. Okay. Right. Um, generally, if you cook something with alcohol for 15 minutes, about 40% will be retained. Uh, 34 minutes, about 35% will be retained. And even if you cook it for up to 2.6 hours, you will still have 5% left in there. So aside from doing like a long, long, long pot roast, you're still going to be able to get a little bit tipsy if you really try hard enough or if you eat a big enough dish. So if you go out to dinner and there's like a, you know, some wine in the chicken and whatnot, and they only cook it for like 15 minutes, would you fail a BAC? 
Uh, I'd have to do the math on that. I, you know what? That's homework. We're going to go ahead and find out how. Okay. Maybe we can do that one day. We can just decide to cook up like a very alcoholic dish and see if we can fail yeah. a blood alcohol test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll save that for a later episode because we got a drinking episode coming down the pipeline as well. Yeah, and for the record, we're going to buy a breathalyzer. We're not going to, like, eat the big dish and then go driving around and swerve until a cop pulls us over and be like, oh, <laughs> dude, it works! <laughs> See, officer, we're doing this for a podcast, so, you know, it's legal. It, don't worry about it. Officer, uh, please, I got a little feel for me. Just please verify, <laughs> are we drunk? <laughs> just speak in the microphone real quick, please. Just state your name and, and how intoxicated we are at the moment. But that, yeah, no, no, no. So I think that'd be good, though. That, uh, I just kind of thought of that, and it'll be fun to do. We'll do that with the drinking episode. Oh, you just gave away the fact that we're doing a drinking episode. Well, I'm just saying, you know, we got some some things coming down, you know. People to stay tuned for, little little things to keep people interested. Something to look forward to, adults. Exactly. Not kids. Not kids. Anyway, so that one uh, kind of dispels that one quick and dirty. Uh, and that's the type that I like, where it's just one of those things that... Th- that one is one that I hear probably the most. It's definitely the top five in food, where I always hear, oh, the alcohol cooks out, so it's okay. Truth is, no. And there are some people that actually have really bad alcohol intolerances or actually have alcohol addiction. So you really have to watch out with what you eat. Because there's a chance that uh, it, it, I don't know of any cases where somebody has relapsed into alcoholism from this. But um, certainly if you can drink, ma- uh, like not drink, hopefully not. But if you can <laughs> swish mouthwash and fail the little uh, ankle bracelet test if you got a DUI, I'm sure if you ate a nice hefty serving of Bananas Foster, that's a chance that you might actually fail it. Yeah, yeah. I, I never really thought about that. We'll see if like maybe they have like uh, a list of banned foods and stuff like that for like when you when you go take your test for ankle bracelets and stuff like that. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at We know that. people or two that we can ask. Yeah, we got friends. 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 A people or two. Yeah, yeah. A people or My two. My English are bad. Yeah. <laughs> So we got alcohol cooking out. And I know there's another big food myth that you and I were talking about earlier. And it's one that I believe to be true, but you called bullshit on it, I believe. It was about MSG. Yes. So MSG, the big monosodium glutamate, also known as, uh, well, monosodium glutamate. <laughs> I just had like the biggest like brain <laughs> shut down for a second where I was just about to cross the threshold of like saying the name and then the port college just shuts down just like nah bitch you ain't saying it uh yeah, what great. else I was gonna say is accent um it's more traditionally known to be used in Chinese food and by Chinese food I mean the American version of Chinese food yeah the bastardized version of Chinese food. yes uh, and we can get into that a little bit but also we have Cajun food um which actually is it's called accent uh, and it's been used for years upon years upon years, and nobody's really called bullshit on Cajun food giving the same results that you would say after you go to, like, Hong Kong Kitchen or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a real place, and you should totally go if you're ever around if, us. If you are anywhere near a Hong Kong Kitchen, I don't know where you are, but you should go there immediately, because so, it's delicious. So, a little bit of a background between, uh, about monosodium glutamate. Uh, first off, Josh, what are some symptoms that you normally would have if somebody were to go to a Chinese restaurant, just like the takeout type, the one that Jewish people go to for Christmas? Okay, uh, like, so you mean like bloated, like hands and like sweaty palms and like they're sweating and they're getting full sooner than normal and stuff like that? Yeah, you know, the general getting full like immediately and then yeah. 30 minutes later, you just, you're, you're hungry, hungry again. again. Yeah. And then also uh, there's everything from like fainting to just headaches and a whole plethora of issues. Well, the deal is, is that monosodium glutamate is kind of a, it's, it gets a bad rep, but uh, we'll go into a little bit of, um, a little bit of backstory on it. So uh, monosodium glutamate itself, it is actually the salt form of glutamic acid, which is a uh, acidic form of glutaminate itself which happens to be a very important neurotransmitter in our bodies, uh, which means that it is necessary for our brain cells to communicate with each other. It's kind of like their little mailbags to talk to each other and just uh, continue with any vital processes uh, throughout the entire body. So right off the bat, it's important. We need glutamate in us. It's actually found in just about anything you can think of because it's a building block for a lot of proteins. 
um, some other things that monosodium glutamate is found in is milk, eggs, beef, chicken, particularly potatoes, tomatoes, and cheese. And it's also found in small quantities in corn, oysters, and mushrooms. And that's just a small list that I picked and chose from. But it's in a whole lot of different things in different quantities. But regardless, it's still there. It was discovered in 1866 in Japan. Actually, it was discovered in Germany. And it was actually isolated in 1908 in Japan when a scientist was trying to find out this uh, fifth flavor that didn't really fit into the other four categories they had at the time. You have your sweet, your salty, your sour, and your bitter. Well, they have kind of like this uh, kelp broth that they would eat back then. And they wanted to find out what that flavor from it was. So they found the seaweed that they made this, uh, this broth with. And they extracted monosodium glutamate, and they found that it accounted for this flavor that they called umami, which better translated to today would be kind of the savory or meaty flavor. Something that definitely is there, but I guess it's a little bit more subtle than the others. Because really when you eat a steak, really it's kind of intuitive to say it's meaty. Yeah. But if you were to try to describe it with the other four different taste categories, that you know, it's completely uh, unseasoned or anything like that, it's kind of hard to describe. So, it's a little bit of everything almost. Okay, so like... MSG gets this bad rap in Chinese food for being something that makes you full when you're not actually full. It just tells your body that it's full from what I was, you know, the, the, the rumors that I always heard about it. But in actuality, it's more of a flavoring? Yeah, well, okay. the idea about it is that it actually can enhance flavor. It's yeah, both a flavor okay. and a flavor enhancer. Right, right, right. Um, okay, yeah. The reason why a lot of people think Cajun food tastes so good is because there's so much accent in it. It brings out a lot more subtle flavors that you normally wouldn't notice. So how did it get a bad rap? Well, in 1968, somebody named Robert Holman Kwok. Uh, <laughs> I can't get name. over that name. Every time I read it, I'm trying to figure out who this guy was. I would, I would love to know more about he's Robert got, Holman Kwok. He's got four goddamn names at least. That's the ones that I read. Holman Kwok. Holman Kwok. But Robert. Like, Bob. you know. He's pr pretty Anglo in the front, pretty, I guess, Asian in the back. He, he's, like, he's like the mullet version of that. <laughs> Oh, He's the white Asian mullet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Anyway, so uh, Dr. Homan Kwok wrote to the New England Journal of Medicine that he had a peculiar uh, symptom every time he ate Chinese food, which was uh, all the classical things that we say today. Uh, he had swelling of the hands. He had a headache. He was a little bit lightheaded. Uh, all the plethora of things. And he posited that it might be the MSG in Chinese food. Well, it turns out that he also said it could be uh, the high salt content in the Chinese food, what he previously ate, a whole bunch of different things. He had drank enough water that day, but they decided that MSG was kind of the outlier that people hadn't heard of before, and people love sensationalism. Really? So, yeah, would you, you believe don't that? don't say. Right, you know? So they kind of took off with that and decided... Yeah, uh, f*** MSG. We're going to go ahead and just get our pitchforks out and our torches and just chase that little monster down the f***ing alley <laughs> yeah. and just, like, drown it in a well. Yeah. And then Chinese people still keep using it in their food because they didn't give a shit. Well, that, that's the thing is, like, if this if MSG was such a problem, then why isn't there such an epidemic of people in China having bloated, you know, bloated bodies and swell you know swollen hands and stuff like that well because it's not actually chinese well, food that, here. Well, that's what i'm saying well no, that's another thing but i'm just saying like if if the chinese use it in their food though i'm saying why wouldn't there be more people having those symptoms i as in like a whole country if they you know use it as predominantly as people are led to believe that they do right in cajun food like down here in new orleans people would look a whole lot more hungover than they usually do like <laughs> all the time because they're eating cajun food well you know maybe that's why here in Louisiana, people are so overweight is because they're not actually overweight, but in actuality, they're just so bloated from all the, the accent that's in their food. Huh? Guys, I'm just swollen. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I'm not fat. I've just, I've just had too much Cajun food lately. It's not a big thing. It'll pass. I got to watch my monosodium, not my actual sodium, just my mono. <laughs> oh my God. I, Ryan, we're going to create some kind of movement here. Oh my God. If it's multiple sodiums, it's okay. But if it's only one damn sodium, you have to just get that out of your diet, man. Two sodiums is fine. One sodium is mm -mm, no mm. dice. No sodium. <laughs> uh, getting into the bullshit about MSG. So a few people started questioning this because uh, a few people realized that this whole Chinese food syndrome is an American phenomenon. Uh, it is 
barely never reported anywhere else in the world. It's only here. It's kind of became a fad. And then everybody else is saying, well, we eat Chinese food and we're fine. Uh, we don't know what's up with that. So people decided to naturally do some studies. Um, a double-blind placebo-controlled study was done on 130 different participants. And there was a whole mix of people that were just your average Joes to people that swore by the whole MSG spiel, that they were very uh, like sensitive to MSG. And out of those 130 participants, they only had two positives that matched up with actually having MSG in the food that they were given and having the symptoms that they claimed to get from MSG. So uh, two out of 130 is not a very good test sample when it comes to proving something is true. There's going to be the people that are like, well, there's those two people that happened to them. So it's true. <laughs> it's just like the psychics. Like you guess that somebody's shirt across the globe is green and they're just like that person's fucking psychic, yeah. man. Miss um, Cleo. Right. <laughs> Call me now, man. Call me now with your green shirt. I know what you're doing. Yeah, darling. Yeah. I know you've been taking an MSG. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, darling. You're not fat. You're just eating the MSG. It's okay. Cut you just out. got the swole. <laughs> yeah, you just got the swole. That's what they should call it, the swole. So that kind of just stomps that one out a little bit. And there's been plenty of other studies, but that's, I think, the biggest one that they've done. And also a little bit of an extra tidbit is that uh, there's the idea of the LD50, which is the amount it takes in a lab-controlled test. Uh, if you have, say, 100 rats, I believe it is the amount of uh, substance to kill 50 of those rats. <laughs> Uh, that they're testing. So it turns out that the LD50 for monosodium glutamate is five times greater than that of table salt. So the amount that it takes to kill 50 rats requires more salt than it does MSG. No, it requires less salt, actually. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. So it requires more MSG than salt to kill them. Yeah. So if you huh. really need to kill some rats and you have nothing else besides MSG and, and some salt. table salt, yeah, just, salt, just start pouring it all over <laughs> everywhere and just hope they eat that shit up. Wow. Um, I never would have guessed that. Yeah. It, like I said, it's glutaminate. It's one of those things that you really need in your body and is very present in your body and among plenty of other things. Sodium and regular table salt is as well. Uh, but it's just one of those things where it's sodium and glutaminate, so it's kind of a double whammy. It's it's perfectly safe for people. I know that some people are going to walk away from this saying, well, Ryan's just full of shit. He's a shill. But, you know, it's whatever. People it, say that anyway. That's what we have sources for. Exactly. Um, all I, right, so what we got next? Well, so I do want to take a quick moment here to, to say that we're going to do the best to explain this as like in layman terms as possible. Ryan is, has a much deeper science background than I do, and that's because I don't really have a science background, but Ryan has a very deep science background. About as deeply as the kiddie pool. Exactly. And I, I, I mean, I know, I, I know shit, to you know, put it bluntly, but I don't, I, I don't have as much expertise as Ryan does, so it's not going to be hard for me to explain it, like, you know, talking to myself, so dumb people, but... Ryan has, you know, done a pretty good job, I would think, of explaining it that way. So, but we're going to do our best to make it, you know, so everyone can understand because, I mean, I don't know what some of those words are that you said, but I know what they mean based off context clues because knowledge is power. Right. And I'll try to condense it as much as possible. I'm saying it like I'm the big wig or I'm like fucking Bill <laughs> Nye or something. But no, yeah. I mean... Uh, I, I occasionally do some reading, but at the same time, I don't want this to be just like a science podcast where it's just going over anybody's heads. I right. want it to be accessible to everybody. And um, we can make it, you know, we can talk like we're talking to stupid people. Nobody that we're listening, that's listening to this is stupid, of course, because they're listening to this. I no. mean, they're getting educated. Duh. Well, we're the stupid ones. Yeah, well, that's that's very true. Yeah. I don't think anyone will debate that after listening to us. But uh, speaking of stupid people, uh, wooden spoons, Ryan. I, I know I heard this and I don't I don't believe if you heard this or not, but the there was a myth that I was told that when you're cooking, if you take a wooden spoon and you lay it over the pot that you're boiling the water in, that that will cause the boiling water to not splash over the sides. Did you ever hear that? Uh, I may have heard it a while ago, but it blanked out of my head until you recently mentioned it about a week ago. Yeah, it, it's 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 pretty interesting because it kind of works. Uh, I don't really know why it did until I well until I did the research, but I was always just told like you know okay why does it does that well, you know why why does it block the water from boiling over, and I was always got well you know it's just 
Because of him, and uh, you know, and the water boiling is the. But you know, it has with like the boiling water, and then like when you put the spoon on it, it pops the bubble. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which actually, you're actually kind of right, Ryan. So what actually happens is that when you're boiling the water, you when you lay the wooden spoon over the top of the the pot, it it actually breaks the surface tension. So when the water boils, and the the bubbles will gravitate towards an area where there's an open space, and since the spoon covers such an, an a, a large amount of the surface tension of where the water is bubbling, it'll gravitate more towards where the wooden spoon is, and that is what caused it to not boil over on the sides. Now, there's a little caveat to this that if you have that bitch cranked up all the way, and you know you have it on maximum amount that of the flame and cause it to boil the quickest. Yeah, it's gonna spill over on the sides. But if you you know you have a a medium high you know kind of pot boiling. And you have the wooden spoon laying over the top of it. It's gonna you're gonna be good to go. You're not gonna really have to worry about anything. Wait, you can buy pot by how high it's gonna get you. Yes, you, yes. Uh, so if you have a medium high, I'll be all right. <laughs> yes, you can buy three pots that get you that high. Oh, okay, three pots. Now uh, there was another thing though that when you and I were discussing it was actually adding salt to water it takes longer to boil, and that's actually true because of science. And I'll leave it at that. No, I'm kidding. Uh, because oh you oh me. So when you when you have water boiling, simple mathematics states, you know we know that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, when you add salt to it, though, you're increasing the density of the water, so that means the water's heavier. So because something is heavier, it's going to require more of some kind of catalyst to get um, a reaction out of it. So when you have the water and you put the salt in it. You're going to need more fire, which means you're going to need it to be hotter in order to get a reaction. So actually adding salt to your water increases the boiling temperature by about four degrees Fahrenheit. So you're probably better off boiling the water than throwing the salt in there if you're in a rush. But I mean, the difference between getting something 212 degrees and 216 degrees, I can't imagine is that big of a difference for people. Oh, who knows? Uh, another interesting thing about salt is that it actually lowers the freezing point, too, uh, which is why of water, that is. Which is why a lot of people salt roads when it's icy conditions is because it hopefully stops any other uh, water from becoming ice faster. Yeah. I mean, do you ever remember like in high school, uh, not in high school, maybe in grammar school, when one of your dick friends just decided to be like, oh, here, just put some salt on your hand. And then they just put an ice cube on it afterwards. Oh, uh, yeah. Dude, that hurt like shit. Uh, okay. Well that, well, that makes sense because they're dick holes. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So that totally makes... I never put that put that connection together, but I mean, it makes... Science tells me so. I guess I'll believe it. Oh, the Legos clicked in your head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're going to go on from salting water to searing steak. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're good with that. Yeah. And by the way, you're doing good, Josh. I mean, you, your explanations are just great at the moment. I mean, I think even like some people like your Uncle Rusty would understand that well, one. Well, you know, Uncle Rusty is someone that I admire to explain things to because he's dumb. And I don't like him. Oh, so Rusty. Well, so let me ask you this. If you know somebody named Rusty, what would you imagine their profession in life would be? All right. So I've never actually met your Uncle Rusty. I know you but I, I just heard the Uncle Rusty stories where you use him as kind of like the low bar. Well, he, that, I mean, that's what he is. But if I was to guess Rusty, I I just see car mechanic in my head. That is 100% correct. Awesome. Yep. I mean, <laughs> Wait, really? I, I, like you would think that people like I, I am a firm believer that if you name your kid. Something and this is no knock on my grandma, love you, Nana. But I mean, I mean, honestly, his name is not full name isn't Ru Rusty. It's Russell, but he goes by Rusty. You would think that life kind of pulls you to a certain thing. No, we said his whole name. His first name is Russ, and his last name is T. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, that's right. I didn't want to give that out, but you you spoiled it, Ryan. It's fucked up. We're talking about a real person. I know. And he's one hundred percent real, and he's like he's my uncle. He's my actual uncle. But I when I try to explain something to dumb people, instead of looking in the mirror, I look at him. And I, and I struggle because I use big words that have more than five letters in it, and he doesn't really know what I'm talking about, but uh, I do my best, so. Yeah. Uh, and for the record, we're not calling all car mechanics stupid, just Uncle Rusty. No, just Uncle Rusty. I like car mechanics. They know stuff that I don't know about my car. No, they, yeah. They mechan my car all the time. They, so. they mechan the shit out of your car. Yeah. So when, when probably, that's going to be a recurring thing that we're just going to be talking to Uncle Rusty from now on, and that's what it's going to be about. We're going to have Rusty moments. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so please, steak searing. Let's get on with that away from my family before I get in too much trouble. Right. So this is the one that I get vicious towards. Like, um, I'm a little bit into cooking. I'm a little bit more into cooking science. I just never have enough time to do it. But at the same time, I still like to listen to a whole bunch of different podcasts and read a few different books about it. Um, it it's fascinating to me because it's like one of the most vital things in life that you have to do is eat and you just got to know how to cook the things you're eating to enjoy that vital part of life. But one of the biggest myths that I've seen and I just keep hearing on and on and on and on is that searing steak will seal in the juices. This is completely false. I'm not even going to a preamble about this because it just, it just pisses me off to hear this one. I get unreasonably mad. Like I get like a hate boner over that, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate boner better than a fear boner. Oh, I don't think I've gotten that recently. Oh, yeah. You haven't lived till you've gotten a fear boner. Oh, man. I'll let you know next time that happens. Um, Please do. I'll text you. I'll show you what's happened. <laughs> Snapchat me. Right. Snapchat me the fear boner. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not wearing, like, workout pants at the time. Oh, my God. That's going to be so great. That's going to be great. Okay. Sorry. Check I'm the me. show notes for fear boner Snapchats. <laughs> <laughs> you can find rumor flies on Snapchat at uh, fear boners. So, so anyway, I'm kidding. You can't do that. Anyway, so let's go ahead and just get into like the brass tacks of this. So steering steak, the easiest way to test this right off the bat is something in the science field, which is the like the easiest and like one of the most classic tests that anybody's done. And it's called gravimetric testing. It's the idea of comparing weights before and after. So what you can do at home is you can get two nice cuts of steak, make sure they're the same cut, about the same marbling content, and particularly the same weight. That'd be great. Or at least record them beforehand. Yeah. You can do percentages if you really want to, you know, go the extra mile afterwards or just make it harder for yourself. Be but for the most part, just get the same weights. Uh, and what you can do is take one of them and cook them. Uh, one of them slow and at lower temperatures, like not very hot at all, like in an oven or something like that. Like, you know, maybe just roast it a little bit or just like, you know, cover the pan and then just cook it at like almost simmer over time. And you can still get it rare. Just make sure you cook them to about the same pinkness or grayness if you're a heathen. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> dude, f well done. You're not making a burger. If you like shoe leather, go ahead and scorch the bitch. But anyway, sorry. Right. So if you like non-dried beef jerky, just go ahead and cook it to well done. It'd actually be more dramatic results if you cook both of them to well done. Um, <laughs> so maybe you can go ahead and do that and just throw it to dogs who won't eat it anyway. But the other one, you should sear. So the result of steering uh, versus uh, low and slow cooking is you're going to put them both on a scale afterwards and you'll find out that the one you seared may weigh considerably less, or I would venture to say will like, weigh considerably less. That's because when you hear something searing like that, that's something evaporating. And if the pan was dry beforehand, what's going to be evaporating? Ooh, I know this one. Okay. Water. Yes. Yes. Particularly the juices. Whew. It's just like when you cook a shrimp. And you know how it goes from straight tailed and like curls up into nice little horseshoes or something like that? Right. Yeah, yeah. When muscle tissue is heated, it contracts. And just like you would if you squeeze a sponge, it'll squeeze the juices out. Uh, not only that, when you cook it, you can lice some of the cells. All the ways that you can damage meat is if you freeze it beforehand. It won't, you can still get a good steak out of it, but I don't do it just because it kind of compromises the texture of it. You get into that more later, maybe in another food episode. But for the most part, Searing steak is going to just get that straight that steak to contract faster. And not only that, after it contracts faster, it'll just squeeze the juices right out of it. So you may think that crust is a nice little protective layer. It's not. Um, what you can do if you really have to sear something is, you know, cover it in butter or something that, that a layer that will not evaporate as easily. That fat layer will prevent some of the moisture loss. That's just why you baste a turkey too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that makes the, sense. It's the same type of, um, same principle. Yeah. Okay. Getting a little bit into this, since we actually like to dig a little bit deeper into the history behind these myths if we can, the person who first came up with this idea is kind of amazing to me, actually. His name is Justus von Liebig. He was a chemist in around, around 1850, and he's actually known as the father of not only organic chemistry, but the fertilizer industry and beef extracts. So he's like one of those Chinese gods that's like the, the you know, the god of like rivers and money and bean curd. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, he, so he's kind of dipped his pen in a lot of inks. Is that correct? Exactly. He's yeah. actually, his family started the company that trademarked the bouillon cube. 
Okay. So okay. this this guy was a smart cookie. Yeah. Like he knew what he was talking about. Except, except when for, it came to searing steaks. Yeah, except for cooking. Okay. And yeah. like I said, this guy <laughs> is the father of organic chemistry. Yeah, you're gonna screw up along the way if you're inventing a field. Yeah. Um or discovering a field rather. But really, I just told everybody that graviometric testing has been around since the dawn of science. Like, people have been doing that. It's one of the first tests that people came up with. It's, it can be used across the board for so many different tests. I used to work in a lab with some really high-tech equipment that I loved playing with, but for the most part, it's kind of like an Occam's razor type uh, answer. I mean, it, the simplest solution is usually the right one. Right. And for a lot of tests nowadays, it's still, and especially in the food industry, it's graviometric testing. Um, they do this for anything from like fibers to um, you know free fatty acids, just tons of different things. So this guy kind of missed the mark on that one. And after he published his idea that searing steak seals in the juices, he a lot of famous chefs around him decided to run off with that, and that became kind of a big thing to do. And in in fairness, searing steak does give it some extra flavors. Like people like that kind of like crisp uh, texture to it, and also there's just the browning effect. It it, it tastes great. I mean, it, it does taste good, but if you really want nice and tender, don't do that. So that's pretty much my wrap up of why people are stupid for searing steaks. So one person caused this whole phenomenon, basically. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's the kind of the long and short of it. Yeah, yeah, no, no. You know, I, what? I'm gonna say it. People are not stupid for doing it. They're just uninformed. Yeah. <laughs> well, education is 99 percent of the problems with most things. In all fairness, but yeah, I mean, like, so what you're saying is you're not wrong if you're searing a steak. You're just wrong if you're saying that it's gonna keep all the juices in. Right. Okay. You see, I just had those knee jerk things where I just calling people stupid just because they didn't look up how to sear a steak or anything. They just listened to people that they trusted. Get an and education, you idiot. See, I'm telling you, I'm about to get that hate boner. Like, <laughs> I'll be on the lookout for it. And, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so we're, we talked about searing steak. Uh, what, is there anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, this one's a little bit more fun. And this is kind of one of our, uh, I guess, Facebook or BuzzFeed rumors of the day. Um, and it actually isn't of the day. It's from like a couple of years ago, to be honest. So in about 2013, I believe, there was this little uh, tidbit going around on the internet that was saying that raspberry flavoring... Do you know this one at all? No. No, no idea. from seeing raspberry flavoring? Uh, I know that I like raspberry flavoring. I don't know for how much longer I'm going to like raspberry flavoring, but... Uh, well, congratulations. You have people that don't post it from BuzzFeed as much on Facebook. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, so raspberry flavoring. The... Big fact of the day back then was that raspberry flavoring came from none other than a beaver's ass. Yo. Not one beaver, just beavers in general. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. that's good. That's that's an important clarification. Right, there we go. <laughs> so this is one of those where you're just like, oh, this is complete bullshit. Like, there's no way this is actually true. Somebody just did this to get like one of those things. It's, it's like saying there's, you know, tons of rat feces and Chips Ahoy cookie. You know, when it really is, there's a regulation for how much can be in there because there's no way to stop a rat from shitting in the process of growing the grain all the way over to making the cookie. It's going to happen. It's just a little bit. That's stuff I don't want to think about, though. It's just a little bit. You're going to eat rat shit. Just God. deal with it. Ugh. Ugh. I don't like where this is going already. Ugh. You probably like it. Uh, oh, my God. Now, keep going. Oh. Okay. So, from rat shit to beaver ass, <laughs> yeah. uh, after doing a little bit of digging... It turns out that this is a partial true. We're going to put this in just like the middle category. This is like A and a half, not quite to B. Um, 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 so it turns out that traditionally there is a flavoring of raspberry, strawberry, and vanilla called castorium. And this comes uh, generally from the castor sac of a beaver. And the castor sac is pretty close to the ass, but it's not actually the anal glands of the beaver. It's right next to it. The castor sac is used for marking territory of uh, any land or, like, I guess, wood or dams that they built. So, I mean, if you just smell raspberry around the Hoover Dam, it's because the beaver's just trying to take it back, you know? The beaver's built the Hoover Dam? I haven't been to it. I don't know. No, well, that'll, that'll be on a Hoover Dam episode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or animal episode. Did beavers build the Hoover Dam? <laughs> Oh God! So it's like the castor sac. Is that like the taint of the gooch? No, it's it's right it's right by the ass. 
Um, oh, okay. So, I mean, it's right behind there, and they just kind of, like, shoot it out and just, boop, mark their territory, and everybody has, like, their own special, I guess, scent to it. It's a little bit different depending on what you do. So some of them might be, who knows, like, blue raspberry. The other one's just, like, sour raspberry. The other one might be white. You know, who knows? You know, um, when I woke up today, I didn't think I'd be having this conversation. Yeah. But I'm glad I am. Well, it, it's happening. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is actually traditionally used uh, in the early days of the flavor industry for flavoring stuff like strawberry vanilla and raspberry just to, as a start now the question is is it being used today and the answer is very little but yes oh, for reference uh it, there's a lot easier ways uh, thanks to technology to get those flavors uh you can quote unquote synthetically make them um because there's actually really only uh not exactly a handful but a couple of hundred different compounds that a flavor chemist generally use in certain combinations to come up with flavors for anything from a to z and uh, the, there's already some to account for strawberry and for raspberry and for vanilla. Vanillin's one of them. People have heard that one already. That's imitation vanilla, not true vanilla extract. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I knew, I knew that. I didn't know that. Right. So for reference, about 300 pounds a year are used in the uh, vanilla production uh, using castorium. Okay. Uh, as opposed to the 2.6 million pounds per year used for production with vanillin. So it's a very niche market using castorium still to make this vanilla flavoring. And the same goes for raspberry and strawberry and whatever else it may flavor. However, there are a few people that are still die hard, like hardcore fans of using just beaver ass right there. Uh, like, for instance, the Swedish, who have a nice little liqueur. Uh, they have a schnapps called Beverhot. I don't even... I, Swedish people, please write to us uh, yeah. telling me how to pronounce that. Please. But I do know it translates into Beaver Shout, which can only give you like this very vivid depiction of why it's called Beaver Shout. If you think about how they got that castorium. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. I, oh, my God. Oh. I mean, but if you think about it from a production standpoint, it's a lot easier to make synthetic products and not have to worry about getting a whole like factory like conveyor belt of just like beavers Beaver being like squeezed at their asses just to shoot out the castorium. I mean, they just, you know, throw them in a garbage bin afterwards. We'd probably have a problem with the beaver uh, population at this point. Yeah, I just imagine like uh, that scene from the wall with the kids on the conveyor belt just going down. Oh, except it's beavers. Yeah, and I've read a few things from like, uh, I don't know if they're exactly beaver biologists, but um, let's just call them biologists uh, that like, have been involved with beavers. You would think romantically from what I'm about to say, but um, <laughs> they say that when they're dealing with beavers, uh, they sometimes happen to smell the very pungent scent coming from their ass, and it turns out that it, it is a pleasant scent. So, I mean, I guess uh, one person's territory is another person's flavoring, but uh, I'm just going to take it on their word if I ever see a beaver, because I'm more scared it'll just, the little fucker will bite me. <laughs> Because those things are scary. You know, down here we have Nutria, though. They're kind of like a hybrid between like a rat, a guinea pig, and a beaver. Those are terrifying. They're just like beavers without like the cute little tails, and they don't do they don't build dams. They just eat everything they just, and get yeah. and they get shot by Harry Lee a, felt a couple years ago. You know, <laughs> yeah. They just, they for those of you who don't know, we literally have policemen that ride around in the back of a truck at like ten o'clock at night, just going by the canals, which is like uh, ditches, like in the city. I think people know what canals. Oh, are. I'm just saying for those that don't know. <laughs> Um, and they just literally ride along with like BB guns or, and just shoot them. But they have like a spotlight on the back of the truck and they just like look at the, the base of the canals and they shoot the nutria. That's what they do. The beaver bounty hunting boys. Exactly. That sounds like a great band name. Dude, that sounds like a, that's going to be the next discovery channel show. <laughs> Duck dynasty followed by the beaver bounty hunting boys. With the direction that it's going, that's probably going to happen. <laughs> Sadly enough, I think you are correct. All right, moving on to a little bit different topic. We got the flavorings, and we're going to go into delicious flavors of sodas for a little bit. And I think we're going to let Josh take over in this one. Yeah, so we got three things we're going to talk about. But the first is probably the most well-known rumor, myth, whatever, when it comes to uh, soft drinks. And that's Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. Now, most people believed it because they... The Coke came from Colombia based off the cocaine leaf. And, you know, that's what people use to get high. And they just put it in there and yada, yada, yada. Es cocaína. Yeah, es cocaína. But there's actually some truth to that. So I did a little bit of research. And I think it's worth noting that in when Coca-Cola first started, it was in like the, the late 1800s. It was founded by a guy named John Pemberton. And uh, it was he was an, an, actually an Atlanta pharmacist, of all things. 
So he knew how to add stuff together without killing people, supposedly. That's what I take from that. I mean, what what qualifications do you really need to be a pharmacist in the late 1800s? I can't really imagine there's a whole lot. You need some fancy looking bottles, I think. Yeah, I, they, like I'm pretty sure that's like what he had. They're like, eh, all right, well, you can make a soft drink for us. Dude, as soon as somebody finds something in like a ditch or just like a new petroleum product, like this, uh, this probably cures the common cold. I'm going to start selling it to people. Well, that's actually what Coke was used for. They He marketed it as like it would cure like hangovers and headaches and night terrors and like pretty much anything that he could market it for, he did. And, but he, there actually was amounts of cocaine in, in Coca-Cola when he first started doing it. Uh, and actually in 1904, um, instead of using fresh leaves, uh, Pemberton started using what they called spent leaves, which is the leftover of the cocaine extraction process, which they had cocaine in there, took it out, and then they sold in the leaves, which they still do today, oddly enough. But um, it was measured that there was nine milligrams of cocaine and coke at uh, when, when they first started doing it. Now, to put that in perspective, nine milligrams, if you were to take a regular can of coke, that's 12 ounces, okay? Nine milligrams is like three, what is that, like 10 thousandths of uh, one ounce. So it was less than one drop. Is if you were to take like a like a like a regular drop of water, and instead of water, it's cocaine. There would be less than one drop of cocaine in a whole can, like normal twelve ounce can of Coke. So I thought that was thought that was pretty interesting. But actually, yeah, like I was saying before, to this day, Coke has a is the um, they have a deal with uh, what is it the Steppen Company? I believe it is. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and they're based out of uh, the Northeast U.S., I believe. And they're the Steppen Company is the only company inside the continental U.S. that is allowed to actually have coke, like make cocaine for uh, medical reasons. And what Pemberton, uh, well, not Pemberton, what Coca Cola does is they buy the leaves after they've extracted the cocaine from it to this day. And they use it in their product, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, well, I guess to a higher degree, how Jameson takes the barrels from Jack Daniels and uh, uses those. Yeah, it's kind of like the same thing, you know. You're which making I have the not most confirmed, actually. So maybe we should look that one up right we'll, there. We'll put That's the, we'll, something that I've heard. We'll put that in the drinking mix. Put it in the dock. Exactly. Um, but it's interesting because, I mean, Coca-Cola wasn't the only one that had those type of drugs in there at the time. There's also something called laudanum, which uh, I don't know if you've heard of before. You can actually occasionally in antique shops around here find old spent bottles of laudanum. Um, it's a little bit more fun. It's roughly like a 10% mixture of uh, opium soda. Oh. Yeah. So either you could just get nice and lit off of uh, cocaine cola or you could just do some good old laudanum and just get low as hell. Yeah. Oh, my God. But really, nine milligrams is just a tiny, tiny, tiny oh, little it, bit. I it's mean, such a diluted amount. Like, there was no way you could put... Nine milligrams of cocaine in anything, and no one would have the faintest idea, unless you're a child. I mean, I do, and nobody has the faintest idea. Well, I mean, the Rufalin. Not the childs. I don't do it to childs. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I thought... I, thought I don't do it pretty, at all. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's kind of hard to say, though, that, like, how much of the cocaine leaves are actually in Coca-Cola, because the recipe itself is is locked away in a vault. So there's no way of knowing what's actually in Coca-Cola unless you're Pemberton's descendants, I guess. Well, he sold the company, so who, unless you're part, like, the CEO of Coke and his family. But I don't even know if he knows it. I'm sure he does. It's because there's actually castorium and rat shit in Coca-Cola. <laughs> there probably is. And there's, I still love it. There's no way of keeping it out of there. It's just going to wind up in there with some Coke. Yeah, it's not a big deal. So the next soft drink we're moving on to is Dr. Pepper. Now, I know you didn't hear this. I know Greg heard this, that there was crack in Dr. Pepper at some point. Now, I did a lot of research. I did a lot more research about crack than I care to admit. But out of everything that I looked for and everything I found about Dr. Pepper, not a single thing mentioned about crack being an, an actually a part of the product at some point of its manufacturing process at any point in time. Now, people would say that Dr. Pepper was like crack to them because it was so good, but they're wrong. I mean, it's good, but it's not It's not Coca-Cola, let's be honest. But Dr. Pepper's still good. But there was one interesting thing that I did find about Dr. Pepper. Now, remember that part I said about conspiracies? This is where it all comes into play. Yeah. So there's a thing about Dr. Pepper being the sole reason John F. Kennedy was assassinated. 
All right, elaborate. Okay. I'm listening. So basically, it was, from what I understand, it was pretty well known that Lee Harvey Oswald, which for those of you who don't know, was the man that assassinated John F. Kennedy in the book Depository in November of 1963. Um, he was a huge fan of Dr. Pepper. And before he went to assassinate the president, I, I don't know how else to put it, he went to a vending machine to buy a can of Dr. Pepper. And he put in his nickel or whatever it cost back then. And he pressed the Dr. Pepper button and Coca-Cola came out. Ooh. So Ooh. they're saying that because Coke came out, not Dr. Pepper, it set off a chain reaction, a butterfly effect, if you will, that led to him assassinating President Kennedy. No, if you think about it, that had to have been like, if that's true, that had to have been like the last straw in that guy's like miserable day. Like he woke up in the dark, like stubbed his toe as soon as he woke <laughs> up. He went to go to the post office and like just had just enough change to not get enough stamps to send it off. <laughs> so it was like, okay, whatever. Goes and just like slips on a banana peel and steps in dog shit yeah, on the yeah, way yeah. to the depository. You know, just all these terrible things that happened to him. Then he goes and he's like, all right, I just need to unwind a little bit. Nice, goes, gets a Dr. Pepper, puts his nickel in, comes out of Coca-Cola. Then all of a sudden he gets the idea, <laughs> that's it, I'm, I'm shooting the f***ing president. Yeah, he's like, yeah, well, my day's done. So is yours, Mr. Kennedy. Let's go. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't imagine that this holds any credence what's, whatsoever or it has any bearing on our history. But I, I, I just don't, I mean, somebody wrote it in a book. I'll put it to you that way. And the guy who wrote it is actually a pretty well-known historian about that time, like time period. So, I mean, he, by him writing it gives it some credence, but I think we can all just call bullshit on it. I mean, I think every historian gets to like have their one little like bullshit fact that just becomes like their tenfold actual fact theory. afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like they just, well, I'm a historian. So people are just going to believe it. This is going down in history. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the takeaway from that one is that, no, we could not find any crack in Dr. Pepper except for possibly Greg's crack because. <laughs> because he's a liar and he made that up or somebody was grossly mistaken who told it to him. But I like seeing I like thinking that Greg's a liar is better. So if, if any listeners went out there and just write us hate mail, just direct it to Greg. Tell just, us how bad that idea was. Yeah, please tell us that. Oh, my God, that'd be fantastic. Rumor flies podcast at gmail.com. That's our contact and specifically uh, put Greg in the title. Yeah, you yeah, just yeah. know to read all those things. <laughs> so he does great work for in-depth media, but yeah. he's just a straight liar to us. He's just a bullshit artist. It's, it's just a big scam. So, I mean, all right. So getting back to our last soft drink, we're going to talk about. And this one was more interesting because I actually found a little bit more credence to this one. Um, it's, Remember Surge back in the day? Maybe some of the older crowd might remember Surge. It was delicious. But there was a rumor that Surge and or Mountain Dew makes your dick smaller. I'm just going to let that sink in. A soft drink that if you consume too much of it, shrunk the size of your penis. Well, that all went all the way back to summer camp for me. Well, I, I mean, you have your little rumors around summer camp and stuff like that. But there was actually like articles written about this that people would claim that drinking it would make your dick smaller now this all comes from what the research that i did this can all be traced back to an ingredient that's in both of these and it's called yellow number five and yellow number five is tartarazine i believe i'm saying that correctly this is not mambo number five no it's not mambo number five it's yellow number five because i like a little bit of erica in and, the sun oh my I hate you so much. <laughs> but tartrazine is actually the yellow food coloring that gives Surge and Mountain in Mountain Dew. It gives it that that lime color. Now, people were basically saying that that was the thing that would shrink the size of your penis and whatnot. Now, in 1916, it was required by the FDA to make sure that it was listed in in your drink or whatever else you used it in there. 1916? 16. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's that's when it's been in use since 1916. They were still operating. They were actually doing shit back then? Yeah. Yeah. That's from the research that I found. I mean, we were just talking about all the shit was in soda beforehand. Yeah. But the FDA, I guess, has been around over 100 years. Wow. Wow. That's, that's something I never really thought about. But um 
so th- there th- the amount of tartrazine in there is like you know five milligrams per kilogram of body weight is what they say you know if you if you have more than that it could give you a mild headache to some people who claim that they gave them a headache. So I don't even really know how reliable those people getting headaches were. They could just be bullshitting it. Um, but basically, if they're saying that this is the ingredient that if you drink too much of it and make your dick smaller, in all actuality, it might give you a slight headache, but it requires a heavy amount of it. This is basically what it boils down to. But nothing was shrinking your dick. No, nothing was shrinking your dick at, at all. No. So it's okay with tartarzine. Just gives you a little bit of tartar. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You, you might need to brush your teeth a little bit extra, but uh, uh, if you know you, your dick size is will not be affected by it. All right. So no more Tarzan magazine. <laughs> no, I guess not. And uh, I think we're gonna segue into uh, things of my nightmares, which is get into the dangerous side of foods with yeah. a few different things. Um, first off, we're going to get to, from, we're going to go from a little bit, uh, least reputable to the most and maybe some in-betweens right there. First one we're going to go and do is, uh, there was this, when we were, uh, you know, spitball in this episode, uh, we all came up with a certain common thread with a few different foods and it was, which foods give you nightmares? I heard from my grandma that green bananas gave you nightmares. I've heard this ever since I was little and I just kind of took it for its word. And I think Greg heard it was fried foods, uh, which, you know, I haven't heard that one, but, you know, he did. And And I heard it was ice cream. Right. So just deep fried banana ice cream. Holy shit, that would be so good. God, you'd have the worst nightmares ever then. I know. Nightmares. It'd probably be worth it, though. I'm not going to be honest. It's probably going to be worth it. Right. Um, So a little bit of quick and dirty on this. Uh, It turns out that... All of us did our research on our individual foods to see what would happen when it comes to these uh, these foods giving you nightmares. And so far, what do we got? Zilch? Nothing. I couldn't find anything. Yeah, zilch on this side too. Uh, and it turns out that Greg couldn't either. So, but we did find a little bit of information that says uh, that kind of makes a slight connection to this because there was a common thing going on between these foods that we were talking about. And it's a high carbohydrate content. Um, This is like the caveat. This is our positing section. And this is actually not just us. It's other scientists as well. We just call ourselves scientists. We're not scientists. Oh, we're so smart. This is scientists saying something and us saying that we agree with them. Because that matters. The idea is that uh, (laughs) when you're sleeping, the body, especially during REM sleep, can consume a ton of glucose. And carbohydrates contain glucose. So if you eat a whole lot of carbohydrates, you're going to be consuming a ton of glucose. Well, metabolism puts out a lot of body heat. And supposedly, this can affect the brain functions during sleep. So the idea is that you can possibly get cold sweats and have like this external effect on your internal mind while you're sleeping from the excess heat going on. Uh, certainly, I mean, I've woken up from nightmares in a cold sweat before uh, or just overly hot. I'm not sure if one is because of the other or yeah, vice versa. Or related, yeah. But these people are saying that this is probably the situation for high carbohydrate foods or things with the high glucose levels. And green bananas are one of the highest sugar uh, fruits you can get. Uh, fried foods, obviously. And ice cream, that's just pure sugar and milk, pretty much. Maybe a little bit of flavoring, a little bit of castorium in there, depending on which ice cream you're eating. Yeah. I mean, basically what I found as far as ice cream goes, I've really, like I said, we couldn't find anything definite. But the thing that I found that probably makes the most sense to me was that when you go to sleep, all, you know, with sugar and stuff like that in, in, in your system, it requires more more work for your body to digest it, which then stimulates more brain waves while you sleep which then could lead lead to more nightmares. That's about as as definite as I could get. All right, so we're going to call this one true because my mama said it. That's <laughs> write it down in in the history books. All right. So, moving on to something a little bit more dangerous than just nightmares. We're going to talk about some foods that naturally are pretty okay to eat, but given the right circumstances can have severe adverse effects on your health. Yeah. And the first one we're going to jump into is the good old grapefruit. You like grapefruit? No, not at all. I like grapefruit. <laughs> Why'd you say yum? I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I mean, I like You're the You're lying gra- to the people. I like grape, the grapefruit flavor, but the, like actually sitting there and 
cutting a grapefruit open and putting the sugar on. I don't like that. It's not my thing. You don't like impl- imp- like implementing tools into your fruits? No. They made I, a spoon just for it, man. I'll eat, like, I'd rather have like a mango or some shit, or an orange. Like I'd rather have something else instead of a grapefruit. All right. Well, if you were to eat a grapefruit, would you eat it with salt or sugar? Because I've seen people go on two different sides of the fence. I've seen people salt watermelon, but I mean, plain yeah, and it's sugary. Too, yeah. But grapefruit, I've seen salt or sugar used. I use sugar. My dad used salt. I use sugar. You use sugar? Same yeah, here. Yeah. I think salt's just weird. I do too, yeah. Because that's just, that's technically like a bitter, sour, salty yeah. mix. Everything I, that a fruit should not be. It, and it doesn't sound good for breakfast. Yeah, that's true. I, I just, yeah, it, it's not my thing. Well, especially doesn't sound good for breakfast if you are on literally just about any medication. Um, because <laughs> the rumor has it that grapefruit has severe interactions with many medications. And this one is a big true. Uh, it turns out that grapefruit has a organic compound in it called furanocoumarin that uh, interacts with a enzyme in the small intestines called cytochrome. And cytochrome's job is to metabolize a, uh, literally about 50% of drugs on the market. This has an effect from anything from antidepressants to uh, analgesics, which are painkillers, to heart medication, to a plethora of other things. And what uh, the cytochrome does is when your body takes in some uh, medication or some drugs, it needs to be metabolized. It passes through your body a few times, whether it be through a liver or straight to the blood-brain barrier, but most of the time it goes to the stomach first. And once it enters the stomach, it has this thing called first pass, where the cytochrome gets to work and starts breaking down some of that uh, drug before it gets fully passed through your body. Uh, This works in several different ways depending on the drug, Uh, but... What the furanocoumarin does is it inhibits the enzyme from doing its job. So when it's not doing its job, you can have a few different things like codeine, for instance. If you're taking codeine, (laughs) if you happen to be doing the perp, um, or kiss and pink, depending on which color you have and strength, Mm -hmm. or the yellow if you're a little bitch. Um, (laughs) Pussy. um, So uh, codeine... If you happen to be uh, take, uh, having grapefruit at the same time, if you happen to be making your perp with codeine and grapefruit, it, you're not going to get as nice of a high because it actually interferes with the proper metabolism of codeine and morphine, which will affect you actually feeling it as a painkiller. So that's one of the things that it does. But for the most part, what the um, lack of the cytochrome working in your intestines does is it causes a buildup in your liver. Not even your liver, even. It's in the rest of your small intestine, too. Uh, So if it's not doing its job, you're going to have this potentially toxic buildup of whatever medication you're taking. You can, like, experience tons of different side effects. This is especially important for people that are taking things like antidepressants, especially MAOIs. This can be a big, big problem. Potentially, your medication won't work and whatever possible. I don't want to call it psychosis to be offensive, but just for lack of a better word, any sort of ailment that you are mentally suffering can just come back full force, or even worse, you can have physical symptoms happen, and it can result in death in some cases. So grapefruit is something that you do not want to mix with medications, and if you're ever taking a medication, make sure to check the label because it actually does say on there that you should not be taking grapefruit with this. This even goes for people that are uh, having cancer treatment. It can actually affect the chemo that you're taking. So grapefruit ain't nothing to f*** with. So don't ever eat grapefruit ever again is basically what we're saying. Oh, no, I'm going to eat it tons. <laughs> uh, but it also is present in some oranges and pomelo. But if you're eating pomelo anyway, you really need to reassess your life because that is the <laughs> shittiest fruit on earth. It's pretty goddamn terrible. It is awful. Like, I've only had it once, and that was one times too many. I-, I would eat, like, the whole Aki fruit first, which, by the way, will totally kill you. Yeah. Um, like, not even from mixing it with any medication. That's <laughs> just poisonous. It, it, yeah, in general, yeah. Uh, I will eat that unboiled and everything before I will eat a pomelo. Ugh. Or pomelo. I don't, I don't even get a sh- give a sh- how to it say does, it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't deserve to be pronounced it, no, right. No, it doesn't deserve to be spoken correctly. No. But, um... If you're a pomelo farmer, please write us some hate mail. <laughs> So we're going to go from grapefruit to honey, which this was really interesting to me because I never really gave much thought about this until my brother had his little girl who's my godchild, my niece. And I remember when I was over there, you know, when she was within her first year, I remember talking to my brother and he was basically telling me that there's a whole list of foods that they can't feed her. And I thought that was really interesting. And one of the foods that was on there was honey. And I, and I decided to do some more research into it. But basically, honey 
if consumed by babies, they they now within the first year is kind of like a ballpark. But they generally say wait at least a year before giving your kid any honey. But the reason being is because it can cause botulism. And for those of you who don't know, botulism is a, a sickness that can ha- that can come from a toxin produced by the uh, bacteria, which is the botulin bacteria. If botulinum I, bacteria. Yeah, botulinum bacteria. Yeah. So it, it, basically, what happens is the honey. There's nothing wrong with the honey itself, but the the bacteria is in like dust and dirt. And that could get in the honey at some point. And if uh, an infant eats that, it, it reproduces inside their system and it could actually kill them. So they most pedi- pediatricians say, you know, stay away from honey for the first year. Basically, the, the problem is, is that their immune system isn't up to par to fight it off. You know, Ryan, if you or I decided to eat honey and there was that bacteria in there, it wouldn't be a problem because our immune systems can fight them off. But a baby has enough to worry about and i guess botulism doesn't fit into the the spectrum of stuff that can kill me right now that they worry about so that that actually you know can get inside them reproduce and kill them right and it's actually very fascinating to me about that because honey uh aside from just cold temperatures is one of like humankind's oldest preservatives tons of old egyptian uh foods have been found preserved in honey back in the day and tons of other things can still be preserved in honey. It's not the best now, but it's been used before. Yeah. And that's because it actually is one of the foods that is very, very, very hard to spoil. Given because of its viscosity, because of its uh, osmotic pressure from sh- for having so much sugar in it, not a lot of things can grow in it because not a lot of oxygen or moisture is allowed to give that you know fertile environment for bacteria. Sure, yeast would like go buck wild with it if it had a little bit of water mixed in, but for the most part, it can't thrive because it's just being suffocated by just the lack of anything but honey in there. However, the botulinum toxin is made by the botulinum bacteria. Yeah. And this happens to be an anaerobic bacteria. And that means that it thrives in an oxygenless environment. There, Which is honey. Right. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of interesting because the spores that are, get put into the honey uh, during that time, if a human eats it, we usually have the proper resistances, like you said. Yeah, to, uh, immune systems to fight them off. To fight off those spores from really turning into anything more right. and releasing off that toxin, but babies can't do that. Right. So it's just kind of a really interesting thing to me that it turns out that one of the deadliest toxins in the world, botulinum toxin, happens to be in something so benign uh, to a lot of people and something that's generally considered to be antibacterial or antimicrobial. Now, it's not exactly antimicrobial, but for the most part, it it does a better job than nothing. But that's, uh, I'm glad that you actually looked that up because I've always heard the whole thing with babies, no honey before they're one years old, but I never actually looked into it. Um, I'm guilty for just taking it on somebody's word. Mm, That's, I'm sure that happens with a lot of people, but I, I learned that honey didn't spoil because my Snapple cap told me so. Right. That's what I learned. Anyway, to kind of <laughs> round this out. Um, I know I'm an idiot. Oh man, we could just do like a whole episode on Snapple caps. Oh my, that'd be fun. That, that would be really fun. We should do that. We should. We'll, we'll put that in, in the bin for ideas to come later on. Right. We'll put that in the little like uh, fixins drawer, just like the little extra stuff that we never get back to. This is our fixins. We'll get to it eventually, but we don't know when. And to round out this episode, uh, Greg's got something for us and he's going to talk a little bit about kind of a disease. That's a little bit on the downturn. It's kind of going out of style nowadays. Anyway, Greg, you have a story about trichinosis. So trichinosis happens to be a disease that is caused by a trichinella worm, which develops more readily in uh, wild game and things such as uh, any omnivorous animals, like uh, specifically pig. That's what it's most known to be contracted from. And essentially when pig is fed pretty much garbage meat by farmers, the trichinella worm has the chance to uh, infest the pig with its larva, which causes trichinosis in anything else that eats it, and it just kind of propagates. Uh, lots of different symptoms can happen from this, anything from like headache to nausea to pretty much uh, mono-like symptoms almost, just almost like pain everywhere, like you've been hit by a truck. And uh, more recently, you don't really see this happen because we've had better practices where we don't feed pigs just any given sh- whatsoever and also the fda has kind of cracked down on it and since the 50s it has gone down significantly to the point where i think we're about um 20 yeah uh, 20 cases, 20 a, cases year. a year it's about that yeah but it's really interesting that now of the 20 cases like let's just say you do have 20 cases a year we know somebody that is 
involved with three of them. Yeah. So, Greg, you, you have any little input on this? <laughs> yeah, it's good to be here. I know I was really dead quiet this whole episode. Can't imagine why. So, yeah. <laughs> we had a muzzle on Greg. Sorry. I had to, uh, I had we let to... him out the cage. <laughs> yeah. So, the... um. Basically, yeah, my uh, back in, I'm mean, not guess my parents would kill me if I gave exact years, but I think he, oh, my dad might have. But anyway, my father, my then dad's girlfriend, uh, my, I don't think they were fiance yet, but um, I think your was, eventual mother. Yeah, my eventual mother, but I think they were dating at the time. His brother and his brother's wife, so my now aunt, so basically my mom, my dad, my uncle, my aunt. Um, they all went with, I think it was a group of like eight or 10 people out to Colorado. And I'm not going to go too detailed because we're about to play a segment where my dad kind of explains all the things. But basically, the four, they all went out and the four of them, after going to this restaurant, all got really sick. My dad got the sickest by far. According to him, I'm sure my mom would like roll around something. It's, you know, it's just parents always loving to, to knock each other a bit. But um, apparently my dad literally got it really bad, but all four of them got trichinosis and they didn't know it at first, but he said that, you know, over time they were figuring out their symptoms and going through rotations at the hospital. And eventually the, uh, the, uh, I believe it was the infectious disease doctors got involved and I think it was infectious disease and they couldn't figure it out. And after a while, you know, it took several weeks of them going through horrible, horrible experiences and realizing they might have trichinosis and to the point where, um, it was, Proven it was done, and the CDC got involved. Jesus. So yeah, so I'll let him tell the rest of that story. Jesus, it's a, yeah. it's a pretty, it's a pretty. This was like a really big deal. So here's where Greg makes his dad relive that whole experience. <laughs> <laughs> we now present to you the two Gregs. So yes, hi, this is Greg. I'm here with my dad, also named Greg. Uh, we decide to cover trichinosis as one of our topics for uh, food myths and legends and all the stuff as part of our podcast and. When I was talking to Ryan and Josh, uh, one of the things on the list was trichinosis and its connection to pork. And Ryan kind of winds up and says, yeah, Greg, I don't know how much you uh, you know about trichinosis or any of that, but it's kind of this obscure disease. I'm like, oh, actually, <laughs> I actually know exactly what trichinosis is and had a funny story for him. So, yeah, I'm um, here with my dad and here to ask you a little bit about what happened. So basically you were saying a, few, a little while back, uh, you know, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You were on a ski trip, right? Uh, correct. Yeah, so tell us a bit about this, the, just the backdrop and what ultimately happened. So uh, I was a resident in training at Dallas, Texas at uh, uh, Southwestern Medical School or the affiliated hospitals, Parkland Hospital, and my uh, future wife was training at Children's Hospital, and we went on a ski trip with my brother and uh, some other friends in Colorado. And we all went out and had a nice meal uh, at a local restaurant. Uh, one of its uh, specialties was uh, Cordon Bleu, but it was made with pork uh, uh, instead of the uh, usual uh, veal. Right. And uh, so everyone enjoyed the ski trip. And then uh, about a week or two later, as when people were back at their homes, they started getting these febrile illnesses marked by... Uh, sweats and muscle aches and eventually swelling around the eyes mm -hmm. and uh, no one quite knew what had happened how big was your group like how many of y'all total uh, there were about eight of us and i think uh three became uh, sick uh, who ate uh, that particular dish and it was all the doctors right Wasn't well it, it was it was nell it was nell oh, no, uh, okay. yeah my my brother's a doctor so his wife got sick because she ordered the dish and your mother and i ordered the dish I became sickest because I ate more than anybody else. <laughs> so there's kind of a direct correlation. So the amount that you have does affect the impact of the illness? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Is that is that common? I actually don't know enough about um, I always kind of felt like if you got salmonella, you got it, or if you got this, you kind of got no, it. No, so I, I would think it's somewhat dose-related. I ate a lot more of it, so that I, I probably got infected by more of the right. organisms than so, they did. So you presented stronger symptoms? Correct. Okay, and so kind of tell us a little bit about, like, it wasn't obvious at first, right? Didn't y'all say you weren't sure what was going on and, and you were you were uh, doing uh, rotations, right? You were directing the interns, right? Correct. So I'm, I'm working as a resident at Parkland Hospital and I started to get this, you know, these fevers and chills, but I didn't think too much of it at first, but this dragged on for a couple of weeks and these sweats at night were very, very dramatic. So I started to get concerned that I might have tuberculosis or cancer or lymphoma. Uh, something very dreaded, 
so I went in to get checked out by the other doctors, had some blood work and some routine tests, and no one found anything. This illness persisted for a few more weeks, and then finally they repeated the blood count, and it had a characteristic to it called eosinophilia. That's a particular form of white cell. And suddenly the infectious disease doctor's partner at Parkland Hospital realized what had happened uh, because I had had muscle aches and I had peri what we call periorbital edema, which is swelling around the eyes mm -hmm. and uh, this febrile illness and then eosinophilia on my blood count. And then they, they uh, all came up with the diagnosis of trichinosis, mm -hmm. which eventually was uh, confirmed. Mm -hmm. And what was um, the other, so you, you said Nell and Anne, you know, my mom, she, um, what, what were they going at this time? Were they starting to present, but it, they weren't quite as concerned because it wasn't as severe as yours? Or right. like, did they, because yours was diagnosed, they went and got diagnosed? What ended, what kind of happened with them? Well, your mother, uh, you yeah. know, my fiance at the time, um, she became sick about the same time as I did, but it wasn't nearly as dramatic. Uh, my uh, sister-in-law, Nell, who... Um, it got, I think, the lightest dose of it, came that became ill later on in New Orleans and started to see my uncle, who was an internist, and he didn't know what was going mm -hmm. on. And he actually called me uh, one time to discuss, you know, what was going on with Nell. And I said, well, you might check her for trichinosis because I've just been diagnosed with it. And it's a pretty obscure disease, right? I mean, it's not, this yes. is not, this is like, I mean, I, I have no idea. I guess... This will, by the time we have the episode up, we'll know the numbers of how many are diagnosed a year. But this is just something that there's no way someone would have walked up and said, you, you could have trichinosis just at first glance. No, it's very rare and it's reportable. And that's why when uh, it became apparent that that was the problem that we had, the uh, CDC, Center for Disease mm -hmm. Control in Atlanta, and the Texas Health Department became involved. Uh, I'm sorry, the Colorado Health Department became involved uh, with the uh, with the uh, problem because this was a a public health care issue right yeah that's right because i think you said this earlier but colorado because that's where y'all traveled to go skiing and that's where you had the meal at right correct and um part of the, it was interesting i think mom revealed that wasn't it that the restaurant in question the guy had uh, been raising pigs in his backyard <laughs> was that part of the problem correct he was raising <laughs> his own pigs uh and uh of course we didn't know that and uh, and that's where the infection had. Yeah, occurred. the investigation kind of turned that up, right? When they were looking into the source. Yes. Right, and uh, I think what our research would probably show, but y'all were talking about how part of the way to knock out trichinosis is that it needs to be a very high internal temperature for a sustained period in the pork, and or you're saying it needs to be frozen for a long period. So one way is to freeze out the trichinosis. Right. So obviously, if it wasn't prepared correctly or stored for long enough for the trichinosis to be knocked out, correct? Right. You have to cook it to. It depends on what what meat or product that could be infected with trichinosis is being cooked. But generally speaking, you have to be in the range of about 145 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit inside of the meat mm -hmm. to prevent the, uh, to, you know, to kill it. Or else uh, the product can be frozen for about 20 to 30 days, I believe, something in that range. And that will also uh, kill the, the, the organism. All right. Well, anything else? Uh, no, I, I think that's about it. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing this with us. It's uh, really informative. It's fun to have these firsthand accounts of what we're looking into. So thank you. You're welcome. All right, Greg. Uh, so once again, thank you to Greg and Dr. Greg um, about that. <laughs> Not the same person. But it was it was really interesting, though, because uh, number one, we never get like firsthand accounts. And once again, we are not using anecdotal evidence as proof for a lot of these things, but this is one of those that's confirmed by the CDC. <laughs> and also it kind of uh, adds credence to the fact that this guy that was uh, running the restaurant was probably uh, had his own pigs and he was feeding sh to them in the it, back. It, it, it was revealed that he was literally like just raising his own pigs, like just completely unregulated and unchecked and didn't do the proper whether whether it's fume rot, whatever, who, who knows how they contracted it, probably because of his conditions, but he didn't prepare the meat properly either. So it's like I think if he had heated it to the proper temperatures, proper internal temperatures, had frozen it for 20, 30 days, they might have even dodged the bullet there. So but just a <laughs> every stop bad luck. Was avoided. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We hate, we want to hate regulation, but, but that's, uh, really, that's how we don't have trichinosis. <laughs> that's really cool, though. We really want to get some of that uh, firsthand accounts if we can, just for fun, if anything. 
Um, but that was really helpful considering that, you know, your dad's pretty credible doctor and everything. Yeah, I guess and your so. mom's really credible three, doctor and everything. Three so. of the four people who caught it were doctors. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's let that sink in for a second. <laughs> well, I mean, I, <laughs> three out of four doctors catch trichinosis at a given restaurant when they get port cord on blue. <laughs> Crap. Well, actually it's three out of three doctors. Because three of the four people, the fourth was not a doctor. Oh, shit. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I if you're a doctor eating commercial. at that restaurant, <laughs> eating that cordon bleu, it's 100% eating I'm pretty sure the restaurant got shut down. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you give f***ing three doctors trichinosis, okay? <laughs> All right. Anyway, so I think this is about as good time as any to wrap up. I, I think that uh, I'm just going to kind of spitball here, Ryan. But I thought it was really interesting. I did not know that alcohol cooked out when you put it in a dish like that was just, I mean, I always thought it did cook out. I'm sorry. I was always told that, you know, whenever, you know, that why, like as a kid, if I was 10 years old and I ate bananas foster, like there, I wouldn't taste any alcohol or anything like that. And I really don't remember ever tasting alcohol or anything like that. Right. Well, I mean, once again, there is no alcohol flavoring. So it's one of those things where, uh, you got to really think about it. I mean, people make mold wine all the time yeah, and they have to get to pretty much boiling temperature a little bit below in order to mix it in. Otherwise you wouldn't have wine afterwards. Um, but I mean, in terms of some of the things that you brought up, uh, I will admit that I am guilty of being one of those people that w- just took things for its word with the honey and botulism, even if it ended up being true. Uh, it sounds almost like an old wives tale with like a scientific term thrown in there. Yeah. And, uh, if, if all, for all we know, it could have been a Dr. Oz episode that mentioned that, but <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. It was really interesting. No, I, I agree because it's just it, like There's you said, no it's, way we're going to dodge that Dr. Oz. Train. No, no, that's going to happen. One day. <laughs> it's but, f-ing yeah, coming, it's, it's, that bastard's got it coming. There's nothing you can do. I'm calling you out. Oz. <laughs> all right. Sorry. <laughs> You've got three hours in the room with me. <laughs> Hell in a cell, you and me, ladder match. Okay, anyway, Dr. Oz, I'm coming after you. So, uh, what I was saying was about honey and botulism. Yeah, I agree. It almost sounds like a wives' tale. It almost sounds like something. You know, that your your mom would tell you, your grandma would tell you, and you just kind of followed it because that's that's what you heard. But, you know, that's also kind of similar to, you know, like raspberry flavoring. I'd never in a million years would have thought that I'd be any eating anything around beaver butthole. You've eaten some beaver ass, man. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's not something I'm some proud of. Some technical beaver ass. Yeah, I mean. The best kind of beaver and, and ass. And I think that, and, and, and from a health standpoint, the whole thing about the grapefruit just really f***ing your shit up with the medicine you take. I don't eat grapefruit on like a regular basis, but that's definitely something for people who do. They need to watch out for that shit. Like, there's some people that's like a normal breakfast routine for them is to oh, yeah. eat grapefruit and, you know, and like, now I know we talked about whether it was like sugar or salt that you put on it, you know, I always did sugar. I thought that was normal, but I didn't realize. Yeah, I know a couple people did salt. Yeah, they're, they're f-ing weird, but so, yeah, but it's like really interesting that just eating something as, you know, trivial as grapefruit can really, really f- up your internal system. Yeah. But I, I think the ultimate take home from this in a nice little Chinese takeout box, MSG free, yeah, is that you should never eat uh, deep fried green bananas a la mode before bed. <laughs> I think so. Because if you do, then you're most definitely going to be having some fed up shit. The on your mind. worst goddamn nightmares yeah. ever. Yeah. I, or maybe it's all that bad. You know what? We're going to do a video element. Us. Greg, you're going to be our guinea pig. <laughs> Apparently, I talk in my sleep, so it'd be really interesting. Dude, oh, you shouldn't have God. told us that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be perfect. Bom, bom. That'd be a great video segment. Hey, Greg. I mean, Greg, cover your ears real quick. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, Josh, do you think that people pee their pants when you put their hands <laughs> in warm water while they're sleeping? I don't know, but I'd like to do a video experiment for the Rumor Flies podcast and find out. Find out next time on Rumor Flies. <laughs> oh, God. All right, guys. We'll hope you enjoyed this one. This one was really fun for us. Um, you know, we put a lot of effort into this one. And we thought it was really, really interesting of all the different things that, you know, we tried to to figure out, you know, whether, you know, debunking some stuff or why, you know, like why you can't eat grapefruit, you know, with the medicine and stuff like that. Just it was really cool and it was really interesting. And, you know, I'm sure we're going to be doing another food episode in the near future. Maybe not in the near future, but at some point in time, we're going to we are most definitely going to be doing another food. episode. It's happening. Yeah. I mean, there's there's so much stuff that we can so go pissed. into that we didn't even touch on. Um you know, and we're not even talking about like just like the drinking myths that we that we mentioned before. We're talking strictly just like food like this again. So just be on the lookout for that. Uh, Ryan, do you want to plug our social media stuff? Yeah. Uh, so if you want to write us any hate mail or positive mail, 
Um, <laughs> right, uh, address it to Greg, and it will be at. Uh, you can reach us at rumorflies at gmail dot com. Uh, we are also on Facebook at facebook.com slash rumorflies. We are at rumorflies on Instagram, at rumorflies on Twitter, and our website is rumorfliespodcast.com. He did that from memory. Yep. I've synced it. I've right? Synced it. Did I leave anything out? Nope, nope. I think we're good. So uh, tune in uh, next time, guys, and we hope you keep on listening. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. All right, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. <laughs> All right, for the Rumor Flies Podcast, I'm Josh. I'm Ryan. And I'm me. <laughs> You guys have a great night. Talk to you later. This episode's closing song is Don't Forget You're In There by the New Orleans-based band A Living Soundtrack.